Most of us are probably somewhat familiar with the phenomenon where if you stand near the side of a road and listen to cars passing by, and specifically the pitch of the cars passing by, you'll notice as the car is coming towards you, the pitch will appear to be higher. And when the car passes by you, the pitch will suddenly drop considerably. So you get the characteristic car passing sound. And this phenomenon is referred to as the Doppler effect. Doppler effect. And this is actually uh, based on the idea that the frequency and wavelength of, of waves that are passing by you, be they sound waves or even light waves, will depend on the motion of the source of those waves. So the, the car, case of the car, the source of the waves is the car itself, and it's moving with respect to you standing on the side of the road. But we're going to look at how this happens with light waves. So let's say I have a specific source of, of light waves. So uh, here's a profile of the light wave. It has a, a set frequency and set wavelength, so the distance between those two crests. And let's say I were to draw out my source. So here's my source. It's emitting light in all directions. And I'm going to draw where each of these wave crests are. So this closest one in, uh, the light's going in all directions, so the wave crests make a circle uh, around that object. Then the one that's farther out uh, might appear like this, is where that wave crest is. And the farthest one out will look something like this. These should be perfect circles, but this is about the limit of my artistic abilities. So any observer that's sitting out here as they watch these waves pass, we'll agree that this is what the wavelength of that light is. But now let's say we're going to take that exact same source and say it's moving. So here's our source, and we're going to assume that it has some velocity in this direction. Well, what will these, uh, what will these wave fronts uh, look like then? Well, the closest one in will still be uh, centered around our source. But the wave crests that are farther out will appear slightly compressed in front of the object and slightly stretched out behind the object. And you can think of this as these wave crests that are farther away were emitted at earlier moments in time when the source was, was farther to the left over here. So that's why these farther out circles are centered over here instead of over here, and in that meantime, the, the source has moved. So let's say we put an observer at this point A. What is the wave profile that that observer will see? Well, as, as these waves propagate towards A, A will see the wave crests that are much more closely uh, uh, compressed together. So it will see a shorter wavelength. And let's say I put another observer behind uh, my source. So let's say this is point B. Then the observer at B will see exactly the opposite. They'll see these waves stretched out. So the wave profile that B sees might look something like this. So it'll see a much longer wavelength. And this idea that uh, an object that is moving away from me if I, if I look at the light from an object moving away from me, the wavelength of that light will be stretched out and will be pushed more into the red part of the spectrum. We call this redshift. So we can actually get uh, redshifts that are so extreme that these waves are stretched past the red part of the spectrum and into even longer wavelength parts of the spectrum like infrared or the, uh, or the microwave or radio wave parts of the spectrum. But we call all of this redshift anyways. And uh, conversely, uh, in the case where our source is moving towards us and we see these waves compressed together in shorter wavelengths, we call this blue shift. The light from this object will be pushed more towards the blue part of the spectrum and in extreme cases past the blue part of the spectrum into the ultraviolet and x-raying even gamma ray parts of the spectrum the very very short wavelength parts of the spectrum so this is where our terms for redshift and blue shift come from and it tells us 
that if I see light being either red shifted or blue shifted, and based on how much red or blue shift there is, I can tell you something about the motion of the source of that light. So let's look at this in, in kind of a uh, uh, astronomy context. Let's say I have the Earth over here. So here's my Earth. And I have some distant star. So here's my star, obviously not to scale. And that star is, is sending uh, a beam of light towards the Earth. And let's say that this star is going in some direction with some velocity. It doesn't have to be going directly towards the Earth or directly away. It could be going in, in some random direction. Then the redshift of this object, which is denoted by the, uh, by the letter Z, is defined as the wavelength that we observe at the Earth. So this is uh, what we observed when the light makes it to us. So uh, for if we're at a point A, then this would be the observed wavelength. If we're at point B, then this stretched out wavelength is what we would actually observe. So that's our observed wavelength minus the wavelength of the light as it's emitted from the source. Uh, so that corresponds to, at the source, what wavelength does it actually see itself giving light off at? So the observed wavelength minus the emitted wavelength over the emitted wavelength. And if we assume that we're going at slow speeds, so, so significantly less than the speed of light, then this is approximately equal to the component of velocity in the direction of our line of sight, so we call this V parallel. And this V parallel corresponds to, if this is the direction of the velocity, of my source, I can break that up into a part that's parallel to my line of sight, so the velocity coming towards the Earth, and a component that is, is perpendicular. So we can't say anything about this V perpendicular, but we can say something about the if this object's moving towards me or away from me. So it's the V parallel over the speed of light. So if we, can, uh, if we can find out everything in here, we can learn something about the motion of that source. Well, looking at these two terms that we need to know, the observed wavelength at the Earth, well, we can get that fairly easily. We, we look at the light and say, this is the wavelength of the light that's hitting me. But how do we actually know what the wavelength that was emitted is? We can't actually go to this star and see what wavelength is actually going to be emitted. So how do we get this value? How do we know what wavelength the light started at? And the answer to that is actually uh, related to what we've been talking about in the last couple videos uh, about spectral lines. Now, let's say that this is the spectrum of the source. So this is corresponds to the spectrum that was emitted. And this is going to be the spectrum that was observed at the Earth. Well, when we look at spectral lines, we know that for each chemical, they set off a certain number of absorption lines that are at very particular wavelengths. So a single chemical may give off, you know, some of these, each of these uh, specific wavelengths of light and absorb uh, the light from that. Well, if we see each of these lines shifted by a certain amount, then we know what chemical it corresponded to because this spacing is also unique to each chemical. So we can say what chemical emitted this light. And we know what that one, what if uh, we're at rest, where that absorption line should be. So using these spectral lines, we can actually determine what the emitted wavelength of those spectral lines was and what the, what, where that spectral line is when we observe it. If there was only a single spectral line that we saw, we wouldn't be able to necessarily say whether this shift came from the motion of the object or if I'm just looking at the wrong chemical. But since we get multiple spectral lines from a single chemical, we can usually use hydrogen or sometimes helium and, and look at the spectral lines from those uh, chemicals. We see that each of those spectral lines are going to be shifted 
by a characteristic amount that all corresponds to the same velocity or the same redshift. And this shows us that we can use the spectrum of light not only to show us what the, uh, what the temperature and the composition of the object is, as we've, as we've talked in previous videos, but can also now tell us something about the motion of that source. So this will become another very useful tool for studying astronomy.